live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Tim Stenevec. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. It's a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, crypto recovers after a week of global market volatility through risk assets into a tailspin. Its price, though, still remains below $60,000. And in just a moment, we're going to speak about all of this volatility with Leah Wald, who's now in charge of the firm Cypherpunk. And we'll dive into how institutional and retail investors are behaving with Metafide's Frank Spicer. All that and more ahead over the next half hour on Bloomberg Crypto. First, though, a snapshot of how things are shaken out so far today. The two largest cryptos are mixed on a day when stocks are broadly higher and yields are lower. This after a Fed-friendly read on U.S. inflation. And it's leading investors to think that the Fed will be able to cut rates come September. Bitcoin up a little over over 1% and we got Ether down in the red. But let's take a step back and check out the picture over the past week. Bitcoin actually outperforming both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 following that 8% sell-off last Monday. Bitcoin over the last week up more than 5%. You got the S&P 500 up more than 3% over the last week while the Nasdaq 100 up 4.4%, Katie. Well, let's also take a look at how Bitcoin ETFs are trading because Bloomberg Intelligence found that the biggest spikes still occur outside the usual New York trading hours, and that's even with the launch of those spot Bitcoin ETFs. In fact, you take a look at total returns during U.S. trading hours, they're negative with muted price changes, Tim. Well, Bloomberg Intelligence analyst James Seyfert joins us now to explain more of this research. James, I'm wondering, is this pattern going to continue even as we see Bitcoin ETFs continue to grow, continue to get bigger. Yeah, I mean, my personal thought is, yes, I think it is likely to continue. I mean, if you look at what happened last Sunday, which is when capital markets around the world were virtually imploding, we saw things collapsing left and right. We so in the crypto world, Ethereum led the way down there. Um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin obviously followed as well. And part of the reason for that is when you have a lot of trading, these things, what their cryptocurrencies are known for, they trade 24 seven. The most liquid markets are going to be during market hours. That's when most of the trading volume happens. That's where the depth of the order book is going to be deepest. But on Sunday morning or Sunday night in the U.S. hours uh, and you're trying to sell hundreds of millions of dollars in an asset and the order book isn't there, there's not a lot of people there to trade. You're going to have much more price impact. And that goes in both directions. So it's not just the, the in order book. I would also add that it, it, it's a leverage is kind of built into the crypto ecosystem more so than maybe traditional financial markets. So you get these like cascades where these stop losses are hit in both directions. So going up and going down. So you see a lot of volatility and you see a lot of price movement on weekends and after hours. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go, which is what happens during the weekends. Of course, you have ETFs which trade you know, only during working hours uh, in New York time. But then you have the weekends, and it sounds like what you're saying is that it's still goblin hours when it comes to what happens during the weekends. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's look, there, not everyone is trading there. You don't have the big market players typically with their bids and ass out in the in the market. And so the order books are just really thin. There's just not as much liquidity. So you put in a hundred million dollars of a sale order or a buy order. It's likely to run through the current bids and ass in the market and send the price skyrocketing. Um, oftentimes it, it corrects in other markets uh, during like during traditional U.S. market hours. Um, but yeah, we, we, we basically see this this issue of both liquidity cascades or leverage cascades where people are being stopped out uh, as different leverage as different levels are hit and they're whether that's going up or down. So it's 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 indicative of just the way the fact that the crypto markets are 24 seven versus the U.S. markets, which are five days a week from 930 to four. Yeah. Fingers crossed it stays that way for U.S. <laughs> markets. Katie, I don't know how you feel about this? Why? It'd be great. We could always be hours. on air. You, you just know? outed yourself by not working on weekends. Oh, you know, working yeah. hours. Just for Katie, it's yeah. 9, 9.30. I'm still on Twitter. Right? Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, I'm always online. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst James Safer. Always great to see you. Let's keep the conversation going now with Leah Wald, recently appointed CEO of Toronto-based crypto company Cypherpunk, which invests in the blockchain ecosystem. And uh, we kind of know Cypherpunk is basically a Bitcoin holding company, maybe similar in structure to MicroStrategy, which the U.S. audience might be more familiar with. But it seems like recently you've been investing more heavily in Solana. That's absolutely right. And first of all, Tim and Katie, thank you so much for having me on. Um, we've been very interested in the Solana ecosystem. Obviously, um, there's been dynamics at play for Ethereum and Bitcoin uh, and their growth and also maybe some hiccups along the way. 
Uh, but for the Solana ecosystem, we're seeing large development uh, from the platforms, from the infrastructure, for the community. And it's very important to note for the growth and sustainability of a token and its blockchain is how well that ecosystem and the community developers are building on that ecosystem and engaged. Lee, is this something you're going to continue to do? Sell Bitcoin exposure, lessen that Bitcoin exposure, and increase Solana exposure? What can investors sort of uh, take away from the strategy moving forward? As of now, you can see from the public statements that that has been the strategy. We're very interested in following Solana and uh, the movements of Sol um, moving forward. What would be sort of a typical asset allocation in the end? Like, what's the target asset allocation? So we're also ramping up our staking operations. So we're interested in not only the price movements and holding soul on the balance sheet, but also uh, being an active participant in the soul and Solana staking ecosystem. So from an operations perspective, we're trying to uh, engage and enhance performance. Um, as for asset allocation, um, things are definitely changing at uh, Cypherpunk Holdings, so I hope you stay tuned. Well, <laughs> definitely going to stay tuned there. But I'm curious about, given that you know one of the goals is accumulation here, how do you view pullbacks in the market? You think about the volatility recently that we've seen in Bitcoin, for example, really dipping below uh, 60,000, getting close to 50,000, now back up close to 60,000. Was that an opportunity that you seized on to add more? I think the the market is very interesting right now. You're absolutely right. We've seen a muted demand from traditional institutional investors over the summer. And also, I think that's likely a shakeout of potential seed providers in the Bitcoin ETFs. With volatility, risk parameters may also be hitting in comfortable levels for investment committees. Um, on the uh, Ethereum side, I think that that's been interesting and mixed as well. I mean, on the one hand, they have not accumulated as much AUM as analysts expected and issuers wanted, given where fees sit. However, on the protocol level, uh, and this is also why we're working and looking at Solana, I think it's been immensely successful, given there's been no major hiccups in the network. So Ethereum's capital market structure is vastly different from Bitcoin. And issuers right now holding $7 billion already represents more than 2% of Ethereum's net market value. So in Ethereum, you have staking and restaking, which is a bit of a daisy chain of locked up tokens. And this could have tripped up the ability to source ETH, but it hasn't so far. There's also dynamics within the Bitcoin ecosystem that could have tripped up and they haven't so far. So I think that that's really interesting. Um, of course, outside the United States, though, we have seen an increase in demand for Bitcoin. Mm. And I think that, you know, it's important to note that you know, yes, we're looking at AUM accumulation within the Bitcoin ETFs or large whale trades as indicative of overall demand for Bitcoin. But much is taking place on the individual level where wealth is relative or nation state policy level where expectations and actions, you know, have been publicly discussed. So, of course, you're a publicly listed company. Your uh, ticker is HODL, HODL, of course. What is your pitch to potential shareholders, to potential investors? Because I could see one of the pushbacks here being, why wouldn't I just buy a spot Bitcoin ETF, either in the U.S. or in Canada, where they've been listed for years? Why, why buy shares of HODL versus just going into an ETF? I think that's a great question. It, originally, when HODL was trading in 2018, we were that go-to exposure play for Bitcoin. Since then, we've advanced and grown, and as of right now, being highly focused on holding Solana, staking Solana, as well as being engaged as a Solana infrastructure player, staking infrastructure player, I think that investors who are looking for uh, exposure to Sol, pre-Sol ETF, should be uh, interested in what we're doing right now. Leah, we're fewer than 90 days away from the presidential election here in the U.S. And we're talking to a lot of our guests about what candidates mean for the crypto landscape. And I'm wondering, in your view, who's better for cypherpunk? Who's better for crypto, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? <laughs> Quite the question. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it has been, as we all know, a very difficult four years. Um, it's, you know, we've all had black eyes in the industry. It's been difficult on the banking level. It's been difficult, obviously, as a former issuer to 
work with um, you know Chairman Gensler on getting approvals. We actually at Valkyrie first filed for a Bitcoin spot ETF in January 2021. So it was a long road. Um, as for which candidate, um, you know, when elected could be, quote unquote, better for Bitcoin, obviously to be determined. Hmm. Um, we're still waiting for a strategy to be more explicit uh, in the Harris camp. But I think that it will come out. I think that in the end of the day, we're seeing a different inning right now with the traditional finance players in the market, as well as uh, pushing on a ed very educational level um, cryptocurrency, um, you know, uh, platform education. So I am positive and optimistic that either administration will provide guidance in positive light for the cryptocurrency industry. All right, there it is. Cypherpunk CEO Leah Wald. Leah, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us on Bloomberg Crypto. Well, coming up, Metified CEO Frank Spicer joins us to talk about his $4,000 call for Ethereum and the 2024 U.S. presidential race. And of course, to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin has recovered from last week's global trading swings. Remember last Monday, an 8% decline on the crypto. Our next guest sees Bitcoin possibly hitting $100,000 by the end of the year. So let's bring in Frank Spizer. He's the CEO of the crypto software firm Metified. Frank, good to see you again. $100,000 for Bitcoin. That's your call by the end of the year. Trading right now just shy of $60,000. How does it get there? Well, thanks for having me back, Tim and Katie. Um, I'd say... You know, there's a few things that we have to look at. In the previous uh, bull run, two types of buyers didn't exist that exist today, right? So you, now you have nation states possibly kicked off by uh, Trump's call for, you know, strategic Bitcoin reserve. So that sort of ramps up the buying pressure from a, a buyer with deep pockets in you know, nation states. The other thing is ETFs now, um, they're gobbling up Bitcoin whenever they dip uh, below a certain point so they can pull them and obviously have them readily available for people coming into their funds. So with those two, you know, increasing pressures upward on the, on the, you know, the price of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and, you know, the supply being fixed, I think it's one of those things that like you just can only go in one direction, like barring some type of economic meltdown, uh, the amount of money coming into the system can only push the price up. And I think given the uncertainty of other currencies um, as an asset, I think Bitcoin starts to look really attractive to a whole different set of buyers. Hey, Frank, why, why do you think the U.S. needs a strategic Bitcoin reserve? I think a lot of people understand the need for a strat strategic petroleum reserve, but why a strategic Bitcoin reserve, as former President Trump has called for? I, I think you, you actually hit the nail right on the head right there, Tim, is, you know, you don't need to hold the dollar if you're a foreign country um, to sort of get around or get out from under the petrodollar, you know, the Chinese-Russian uh, alliance for for um, petroleum. Uh, you can actually probably hold uh, Bitcoin and settle transactions in that if you have to, without committing to the dollar, without committing to the pound. It's sort of a more neutral way to approach, you know, the the current block of, of currency options available. And I think it's one of those things where it gives people, so, uh, you know, nation states some more options to, to sort of deal with international politics that didn't exist before, especially as it becomes more and more capitalized. So I follow your argument on why all of this would be good for Bitcoin. Basically, supply and demand, you have more demand coming for a limited supply of Bitcoin. But you also have the call for uh, ETH to end the year at $4,000. And obviously, a strategic Bitcoin reserve wouldn't necessarily benefit ETH. Why do you think that ETH is set for a rally here as well? Yeah, so I think ETH is acting on an entirely different mechanism. The first thing to consider is that right now, Ethereum is near its all-time high in ETH in circulation at about 120 million point uh, three seven, I think, um, or two seven. So just a touch on around 20.3 million ETH in circulation. That's just about the most that have ever been out there. So it's a signal that there's probably not a lot more ETH being uh, minted into the the system. 
um, and the prices have stabilized. And just yesterday, the grayscale Ethereum ETF outflows reached zero. So you're going to have buying pressure in the market. Um, you're going to have a, a, a sort of a near all-time high in the supply, so it's not going to get much higher. And then the other thing is with the SEC regulations, Ethereum ETFs can't participate in staking. So for the system to work, uh, you need to have stakers expand the capacity of the network to validate transactions. That's going to drive block space upwards. Um, more block space means more people are going to hold Ethereum, more buyers are going to want to buy on the ETF. So you have this flywheel effect and you're capped at the, the supply almost right now. So you could have more ETH in the, the network, but it's not going to be um, a surprise. And it's, it's, it's basically right now the price can only run, run one direction for Ethereum. And I do want to talk a little bit about your company and the time that we have left with you, of course. The CEO of Medify described as one of uh, the blockchain ratings companies out there. Could you just walk us through a little bit what that means, what you do over at Medify? Sure. So we have a product that does ratings, which we give away to the community. Um, but what our primary business is allowing people to use our FIDE AI token to participate in real-time predictions with uh, with AI. So people can actually include human input to predictive AI tra you know, uh, systems in financial markets. And that's uh, that's the core business of Medified right now. Frank, how, how well is it working? I assume you've done some significant back testing. Um, give us some metrics on how well it's worked. We're, we're running a test with Mantle right now, and uh, we just completed their, their chain reaction uh, AI competition as one of the leaders there. And um, it's working very well. Humans. Some humans are very good at combining intuition with like near term price uh, movements. We have some folks in there that have won at an 80 percent rate, which is great because it allows us to include that in our predictions for our institutional clients. And in some cases, we've outperformed the market by 30 percent over, over you know, a given 24 hour period when we're looking. So we feel really bullish on it. And I think it's going to be one of those things we're going to be able to take from the crypto markets to the equity markets in the near term. OK, from crypto to equity to talking about the election in November, less than three months to go until the presidential election. Frank, who is better for crypto? Who's better for Medified, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? I'm not going to try to duck this question like uh, I probably should. And like my, you know, I'm sure my press team would advise me. I think generally President, former President Trump has been openly more hospitable to crypto. Um, but I think the real question is who comes in to regulate it? Um, you know, will the Democrats allow for the continuation of the easing that we saw at the end of, you know, the, the Biden run here? It looks like things are starting to turn. And in which case, it could be that it doesn't necessarily matter which candidate wins, but which regulatory framework is put in place. You know, obviously, President Trump has voices, you know, his support for Bitcoin, the U.S. holding Bitcoin. That's great for all of us in the industry. But really, it matters like how how do we approach the, the regulation of it responsibly and allow for the growth and innovation to occur and people start making long term decisions for investment and you know things like that. So I'm bullish on either way right now, mm. but I think uh, it would be great to get some more direction out of the Harris camp before yeah, well, forming a, an opinion on that. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Like you said, bullish either way. We haven't really heard specifics from Kamala Harris's camp, though, as to what their views, what their uh, positions on crypto would be. What are you hoping to hear? I'd like to hear them just say, look, we're going to allow humans to innovate, Americans to do what they do best, which is you know, come up with new and novel approaches to solve things. Uh, you know, it, we're living in a pretty complex world that needs people to innovate. And I think supporting that is the most important thing any administration can do right now. Hey, Frank, always love it when you join us. Thanks so much for taking the time. That's Medified CEO Frank Spizer joining us from Thanks, Myrtle Robin. Beach. Hey, coming up, uh, crypto miner Marathon Digital takes a page from MicroStrategy selling notes to buy more Bitcoin. And take a listen to what Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire had to say last week about activity on his platform. If you look at the trailing 180 days, the average monthly transactions with USDC that are happening on chain, on blockchain transactions, is about $1.5 trillion. That's growth of over 220% year over year.
the most important point for people to understand is that Bitcoin volatility is a feature. It's not a bug. The volatility creates tens of billions of dollars of credit and liquidity at all times, everywhere to everyone in the world in the short term. But over the long term, that volatility is driving superior asset performance and durability. So it's volatile because it's functional. The other markets are all closed and they're crippled by the physics and the politics of the asset. And that, of course, was MicroStrategy's Michael Saylor on Bloomberg Television last week. And Bitcoin miner Marathon Digital making a move similar to Saylor, selling $250 million worth of convertible senior notes using those proceeds to buy Bitcoin. Bloomberg's David Pan has the details. Walk us through this booth. It's not too often that you see a Bitcoin miner going out selling notes to buy Bitcoin. Exactly. I think what makes it really interesting is that um, crypto mining companies, especially the public ones, they usually do not buy Bitcoin, uh, let alone buying Bitcoin through debt financing. Um, rarely do they do that. So I think this is uh, Marathon's latest effort to position itself to be like a leveraged a proxy on Bitcoin uh, prices in the stock market to keep the company's value and the investors from walking away as the competition in the industry heats up and the profit margins getting thinner and thinner after the halving. It's all fun and games while the price of an asset that you buy on leverage goes up. Mm -hmm. But what happens when it goes down? As we just heard from Michael Saylor, volatility, it's a feature, not a bug when it comes to Bitcoin. Right, but like we have to, um, Remember that, you know, like a lot of these mining companies, they are very bullish on Bitcoin. They have a very optimistic outlook for Bitcoin prices by holding Bitcoin, um, by loading, uh, loading Bitcoin on, on their balance sheet. Um, uh, they are hoping that they can just, you know, ride a wave and, you know, they are hoping that there's going to be another rally to boost the value. Yeah. All right, David, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. That's Bloomberg's David Pan. He covers everything related to crypto miners. Check out his work, not just at Bloomberg.com, but of course also at the Bloomberg Terminal. That is going to do it for Bloomberg Crypto. Katie Kreifeld, thanks for joining this us. This was a delight. You know, I got the call and I said, yes, absolutely. Hey, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> uh, join us again in two weeks. We're going to be off next week due to our coverage of the DNC in Chicago. This is Bloomberg.